Hello, Mark Kemp with CampgroundViews.com here at River Run RV Park in Bakersfield, California. I'm with Ryan Yules, who has a unique perspective and background to share with everybody about operating your parks. Ryan, it's great to see you. Nice to see you, Mark. How are you today? Doing good. So, first off, thank you for agreeing to share with everybody a little bit about your experience running a park and operating a park, because I'm sure everybody will find it useful. So, I guess the first question they all have is, and I, even I have, is tell us a little bit about the park, because you built this place along with your family. Yes, about uh, the park's been open for 11 years now and a couple years before that this was just a bare piece of property. Uh, we developed it into an RV park and have slowly been growing it since then. So you, you developed it from scratch at, in this location? Yes, when we when I first got here it was a blank sheet of paper and a bare piece of property so ev everything here uh, started out from a blank slate. So um, the park itself, um, tell us a little bit about the park. It's located in Bakersfield, and actually some folks might not know where Bakersfield is if you're not from this area. And so Bakersfield San Joaquin Valley, which is central California. It's a farm, farm area, but Bakersfield has a unique history. And if you're not from Bakersfield, don't know it, they might not be aware of the history, the fact that it's oil. Ba Bakersfield has a lot of oil uh, industry in the area. A lot of agriculture outside of Bakersfield, uh, also some very unique country music background, Basque population background, so a lot of diversity here in Bakersfield. Yeah, and most people, if they've never been to Bakersfield, they may have been through it. Uh, California 99, which travels north-south through California, passes right outside the park, and that parallels the 5. Yes, we're, up and down. we're about 25 miles north of where the 99 and the I-5 split. A lot of people that think they've passed through Bakersfield actually see the exit sign for Bakersfield off of I-5. Uh, there's a, a couple truck stops, little community there, but they really don't understand that Bakersfield's actually about 15 miles away uh, from that. They just uh, assume that that little off-ramp is Bakersfield. So much so, larger community once they get here. Once you, when you built the park and the decision to build the park, did you grow up in Bakersfield? I mean, why... why why here? Why did you build a park here? I was born and raised in Bakersfield. Uh, when we originally started talking about it, we actually looked a number of places throughout the country. But one thing that we felt was Bakersfield had a lot of RV traffic. We're, like you said, right off of 99, right where 58 comes in. So there's a lot of people traveling through the area. A lot going on here in Bakersfield. And at that point, Bakersfield didn't have any newer, nicer parks. They all had the smaller sites, nothing for the big rigs. So we wanted to build something that really focused on the newer RVs. All of our sites are 50 amp hookups, so there's no electrical issues. A uh, number of our sites are extremely long, large sites, so that we can really accommodate anything that's going down the road today. So we're going back 12 years, so you were really kind of a little bit ahead of the game on recognizing that there was a need for the bigger sites with the more room, and, and you developed the park that's, um, you know, as we'll show them, it's very beautiful. You've got wide roads, and as you mentioned, very large sites. And so um, in designing it, that was you were aware of that and that was what you designed for. Yes, we, we designed for that. We've got a num large number of sites that are over 60 feet long. So if it can go down the road legally, those can easily fit in the site. We've got some of our double long pull-throughs that are actually around 200 feet long. So we, we have some people, car shows. You know, we, those are what, these, these th sites That's these sites us. right here behind yeah. us. Uh, those sites, we can take a 45-foot motorhome towing a 45-foot car trailer. They can put their back down, back the car out onto their site, and they can have all that contained within their site. <laughs> so these are easily some of the, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, these are easily, I challenge other park operators to show me RV sites that are bigger than these. These are some of the biggest sites in the country, let alone in a park. I mean, they're massive. Yes, the, these are some of the longest sites that we've seen. Yeah. Uh, like I said, very popular with certain uh, people that just need that extra length, even beyond what is actually legal to go down the road. <laughs> yeah, you're beyond legal. <laughs> the CHP should park outside and, and, and ticket them as they go. So when you started the park 12 years ago, you started from scratch, right? You built this place from scratch. So you created the name, created the brand, started your marketing. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. What was that process like? Um, you know, starting from scratch, and how did who had the vision, and how did you adapt that vision and build out the business? Going back to before we started, uh, my wife and I lived in an RV. I was working construction at the time, so we got a chance to actually live in a few RV parks and experience not only our experience but also get to talk to and visit with people that were coming to stay. So we got a lot of different perspectives since we were in the same park for extended periods of time. 
and kind of got to see some of the struggles that the people visiting the parks got to experience, uh, which really gave us some insight into what was needed, what was beneficial, uh, what was difficult for people. And then as we first started the process, we actually took a drive and we took thousands of pictures at a number of RV parks and just went and took pictures of things we liked, things we didn't like, things that looked like they were working, and really tried to design the park to fix the problems, enhance the good features, uh, and make it not only a nice place to come, but e even a nice place so that we could maintain it and keep it up. Because one of the things that we noticed was the new parks looked really great. But some of the parks were designed where they looked great in the beginning, but maintenance was really difficult. Yeah. So, like what, what specifically would you, could you share that was like, that, that you worked on to make sure you covered? You know, one, one of the real easy things to see is between our grass and our sites, we've got concrete curbing around all of the sites. And the concrete curbing makes it real easy for us to maintain that nice, clean, sharp edge and really define the difference between the grass and on our sites, it's the decomposed granite. One of the things we saw in a number of parks was they either did boards or there wasn't that real clear definition and it looked nice in the beginning, but it was just always a struggle for them to maintain that nice, straight, clean line. Inter yeah, because it, it over and so you you purposely laid down some concrete edges for the grass to be separated from the gravel. Yes, all all of the concrete, all of the grass is surrounded by concrete, uh, so that we have that nice clean definition. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, very smart. All all of the sites have slope on them, so that we have adequate drainage. Uh, we've been to parks that didn't have that adequate drainage, and it was inconvenient to the guests and. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes level sites. Uh, unfortunately, if it's perfectly level, you end up with drainage issues. So, you know, they aren't perfectly level, but they're as level as they can be to still allow adequate drainage and keep the sites nice for them. Very interesting. Okay, so you designed the park right, looking at some of the stuff that you saw out there. So when you open your doors day one, what did you do to get people in here? Or was it one of those things where you hear a lot of park operators say before they even open, they had people waiting to get in. Was that your situation? We actually booked our first group about a year before we opened. Wow. And the that first group, as we got closer to opening time, we had a few of them come and visit super nervous because they were coming and wondering what they were going to get into <laughs> but they they arrived the afternoon that we were paving the entrance wow so they, they actually got to wait for just a few minutes as the asphalt machine finished the road and drive in on nice fresh asphalt oh, that's pretty cool but we were able to open on time for them and uh, new business first few days were obviously slower that that group was a boost but uh, we've just slowly over the last 10 years, 11 years, kept building on our uh, customer base. And, you know, one of the things that we take pride in is maintaining it so that they come year after year and get to see the park develop. But the maintenance level is always kept up so that there's not things, you know, falling apart and in disrepair. Yeah, because people notice that. So um, we talked a little bit about that. And you've got uh, a large number one you've seen growth in the number of people that are coming through, but you also have noticed that a lot of the folks that end up coming in here, it's not their first time. They've been here before. And so they've come in, they've experienced the, the service, the park, they like it, they come back. Can you talk a little bit about how you, um, or what you do to kind of build that community or, or build that relationship with the guests where they're going to show up again? Or do you even need to? You just have to have a nice place and people will show up again. You know, our, our mission statement talks about providing friendly staff, and we, we want to be welcoming, we want to be as accommodating as we possibly can, and we feel like friendly staff is super important. A lot of times, driving down the road, big rigs, it's stressful, and we, we want them to, as soon as they walk into the office, feel like they're welcome and, and try and be able to relieve some of that stress. Uh, beyond, going beyond that, we want our facilities to be clean, we want them to be safe, so we work very hard to keep a clean facility, keep it kept up so that they feel safe here and really feel like they're part of a community and we want them to be our guest. We don't want them to feel as much like a customer that's just uh, here as a business transaction. So we really enjoy getting to know our guests and it's neat getting to see them return year after year and see their kids grow. Uh, a lot of our guests get to talk about how our personal children have grown and developed over the years. 
So it, it's neat being able to carry on that relation. So in, in talking about that, um, you live on site, right? Yes, my family and I live on site. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have my wife that helps me out here in the park. So uh, it's neat having that husband-wife team and we get to work together. And that for our relationship, that works very well. And then also being able to have my kids be a part of it. So many times you hear of families that the parents go off to work and the kids don't get to experience the work that the parents are doing. And here our kids get to actually see what we're doing, how we're doing it, be involved with it, and and actually get to feel like they're a part of something bigger than uh, just our family. They they're actually a part of the park. Yeah, your your kids are amazing. You know, it's it's just it. I see that, you know, and, and you can see when there's good parenting and, and the kids are being exposed to real life and, and they're friendly, engaged, and that's, I guess that's kind of a cool thing about this industry is being able to do that and, and engage with that, right? You know, it's amazing, the RV industry and the RV community. We've, we've stayed at hotels, as most people have, and when you stay at a hotel, you walk in, you check in, and you kind of get that tunnel vision, and you, you go sit in your room and watch TV, and that's about all you do. Whereas at an RV park, and we experienced it even before we built the park, as soon as you park in your site, so often you're visiting with your neighbors, you're developing other relationships, and even we've had a number of our guests that will make friends with the person they happen to stay next to, and a year later we'll get a call from them saying, we're coming again, and we're calling so-and-so and and this person, and it's turning into almost like a reunion of sorts with the guests that have stayed here yeah. previously. So it, it, it turns into sometimes yearly events where they'll come back and they'll use this as a get together spot. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good and a get together spot. So one of the things, if somebody looks at a, you know, the location of your park and they look at a Google satellite view, um, and they might even hear a little bit of the background noise. I mean, a California 99 is in the distance. You can see it right over here and it's a major highway. I, mean, I would imagine, what, a few hundred thousand people drive by that roadway every day. Yes. And, you know, you got 58, you've got um, commercial businesses around there. But if you look behind us, it's an absolutely scenic and beautiful location. And so we had talked a little bit about that. And you've seen this trend. And, and even you sometimes say, wow, that people don't just pass through the park. They come here and actually stay and enjoy it. Can you talk? I, that kind of goes into the customer service in this environment you've created. What have you done to engage and bring those people and make them feel? Or do you think you've done anything? that allows them to feel like they can stay here longer? You know, I think the biggest thing is they have to feel welcome. And, you know, no, nobody wants to walk into a business, especially when you're on vacation wanting to relax and not feel like the business people, the people at the front desk want you there. So we, we work real hard to make it easy for you. Uh, some of that goes back to the park design, even the angle of the sites. We, we researched how to make it easy to get in and out. We made our streets wide so that once they get here, we, we want to relieve that stress. Yeah. And uh, we've got some long-term sites, but our average stay for our short-term people is three days. So it's nice that they feel comfortable coming, relaxing, and just feel like they're welcomed into the park. So I'm going to do a little self-plug here. And, um, you know, the reason we're here and the reason we've worked with you is we met at the California Association of RV Parks event, and you were... An early adopter for us you said yes you said hey I want to try this 360 video out I want to give you guys a shot and see what you can do and allowed us to come out and do it and one of the things that impressed me about that is that at the end of that year we were able to pull some numbers from your data and show that we had a hundred seven percent increase in online reservations which is you know doubled we more than doubled your online reservations so you were an early adopter in that type of marketing is there any other things that you've done Either well, you obviously we kind of talked about building the park early. I mean, you, you you were 12 years ahead of the time. Like right now, the 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 buzz is I need to get an RV park built and it needs to be built for big rigs. You already did it. You were early to that. Is is that because of your background in camping and RVing, where you're able to put yourself in the customer's shoes and say, oh, if I was a customer, that would interest me, or or what do you look for that that makes you say I'm going to take a chance on this, this or this. You know, I I like to think that I'm forward thinking and try and see what do I need to do in the future to get to where I need to be rather than where do I need to be today. And we did that when we were building the park with how we laid it out with the design of it. And the same goes for the 360 video. One of the struggles, especially with the new park, is 
people don't know what to expect. And that was a way to show them that what they were going to get when they got here. And now with that video, as people come into the park, they're, they're not surprised. They, they know the quality, they know what to expect. And I think it really gives them a comfort when they're making their reservations. And I suspect that had a lot to do with that 107% increase yeah. was the, the website was clean. The website really showcased in a true fashion what we were. And one of the things as we discussed when you first came was we wanted it to be a true representation. We wanted when somebody came in and they had seen a picture or they had watched the video, they were able to identify, I recognize that from the picture. I recognize that from the photo. And so many places you see a picture and then once you get there, you go, where was that taken? Yeah. And it, it just doesn't look the same. And that's actually why we have you back out now is it's been a couple of years and we want to have that true representation so that when they get here, they, they look at it and they go, yeah, that's what I expected to see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one of the things that I know every park operator when they're listening to this and watching this just asked themselves when you said you think 10 years ahead, they said, what are you thinking about 10 years from now? What are you, what are you planning towards? You know, right now we're kind of in a, we've just finished construction. I know that we said that we opened 10 years ago, but even though we've been open 10 years, there's still been a lot of construction related upgrades, amenities, as we find things that don't work, that people would like different, just kind of tweaking and adjusting. And a lot of the basic layout we can't change. But one of the things we just did is we added a little bit more deck into the pool area. We realized that even though we had a nice pool, there just wasn't adequate deck space. So we're we're kind of getting into that finishing all of those tweaks construction area and almost into a maturing stage where we're, we're starting to look at what do we need to make it a nice environment 10 years from now and some of that looking forward is replacing some of the trees even though the trees are where they need to be rather than get to a point where we've we've experienced some parks that once the trees got fully matured and were starting to cause problems, they had to go through and they had to change all the trees in the park, which, which kind of made them completely reset. So rather than get to that point, one of the things we're starting to do is selectively pick trees that aren't needing replaced yet, but that lets us get replacement trees in so that as they mature and the others become overgrown, we're not running into that situation where we're having to do massive tree removal all at the same time. So I'm hearing like um, you're, you're basically developing a maintenance plan to keep the property in tip top shape going forward. Yes, we, we want to get to the point where it doesn't matter when they come, that level ex expectation level can be super high yeah. and, and that we can long term sustain it. Yeah, very interesting. And you know, as you're saying that, I, I, I realize you're, you're a construction guy, you're a builder. And yes. there's a lot, and it, you know, I realize Noelle, your wife, she's kind of like the operations person. She runs things, right? She, she pretty much runs the office. Yeah. Uh, she's the one that very often, if you call, you'll get her on the phone. Yeah. And I'm the one that just kind of, you know, make, makes everything physically operate. Yeah. Uh, so many parks are the same way. You know, there's so many out there like, yep, that my husband builds, he's out there with the tractor or out there doing the work and I'm running the office and answering the phones and, and doing all that stuff. And so, and, and we've had conversations in the past because you live on site, you have a work-life balance thing, right? Because you're on site and, you know, how do you turn that off or do you ever turn that off or how do you build, build a life around running a park? That's one of the struggles, and one, one of the difficulties is because we do live on site, it makes us very available for the guests, and we want to be available for them. That's For us, that's super important. Uh, we feel like we're in the hospitality industry, and they're here for us to serve them. So we want to have that. The difficult part of that is when do you turn that off? Yeah. And uh, that, that's always a struggle for us, but uh, thankfully we are able to get away every once in a while. And thankfully, with our relationship, even though we spend a lot of time on site and on technically on call, we get to work together and we really enjoy that together time and just take advantage of the time that we get to spend together, even if it happens to be working. That's cool. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, they dream about that American dream, right? And, and whatever that American dream is for them. And so often, it's spend time with family, but then they end up working and they're never with their family. So in a way, you guys are really 
kind of doing. You're running a park. You're in a you're in the town you grew up in. You're you're in an area you like, and you get to be around each other. And now, after ten years, you view that the next ten years you're doing that. The next twenty years, do you retire here? <clears throat> we'll see. Okay. Uh, at, at this point, we have no intentions of going anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, the amount of time that I get to spend with my children, the amount of time that I get to spend with my wife, like I said, a lot of it's working, but it's still quality time together. Yeah. And very, very few couples and very few families do I know that really get to spend that level of time and get to know the family that well. So we really do yeah. appreciate that. That's very cool. So you're also a member of the California Association of RV Parks, their board. Yes. And so you've, you've interacted with other park operators and you've kind of gone out and stepped up, and it, it, it stepped up your exposure. What else, if you're, if you're, you know, we're talking to park operators, they may not be a member of their local association. What have you found that it, that it provides you, you know, is it just a networking way? Is it a way to get away? I mean, what do you find from the associations? The associations are important in so many ways. Uh, the, the most apparent one is having somebody to call. And so often, if we have questions, there's somebody that we can call. And the CalRVIC staff, California Association of RV Park and Campgrounds, their front office staff is awesome about having the answers. And if they don't, very quickly being able to get us the answers. And we run into different laws that are changing or different you know, communities that are trying to enact different regulations. And one, they're on the forefront of protecting us so that we don't have to deal with burdensome laws that we couldn't fight on our own, but they, they have the information and the resources to get us the answers that we need. So that's, that's probably the, the thing for us that is the most apparent and the biggest thing. Uh, we also do RV park days where we will have just one day events at different places throughout the state, great networking opportunities and great ways to be able to sit down and discuss with other park owners struggles and solutions. Yeah. And we, we could sit around all day and talk about struggles, yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't do anything for us. But the amazing part is when you get 20 or 30 different parks together, chances are whatever it is that we're struggling with, there's other parks that are struggling with it, but there's also other parks that have figured out solutions to it. And every, every time we go to those events, uh, we've got some amazing speakers, and we learn from the speakers, but we also get that networking, and we get to voice what our struggles are, and we always come back with pages of notes and things to do that just help to refine our operations and, again, make it easier for us to be able to serve the guests better. That's a very good point. You know, the last event that they had was down at uh, Pachanga. Yes. And they did, a, it was a two-day event. They, they did something a little bit unique. And they had a, the first day was um, they did a software session. So all the reservation software guys and gals had a chance to present their software and, and give a chance for people to ask questions. And the second day they did a, um, a disaster. Um, there was a company that provides disaster preparedness. And what, outside of the event itself, what intrigued me about that state association event is California Association of RV Parks. There were owners from Colorado there. There were owners from Nevada there and California. So the events are open to anybody around the country. So if they're looking at, and they're also open to other associations, you know, come out, see what they're doing out here. Because it, it, you know, we've been around to the different associations. I find what California is doing very unique, very engaging, and very useful. Do you agree? A lot of what happens in California ends up, ends up going to other states. So uh, California is a lot of times on the forefront of change that happens across the country. So uh, it, it is unique to be able to be involved with that and uh, to kind of be on the, the leading edge of that change. Okay. That, that event that we just did, one of the very common questions at many of these networking events is what software do you use and how do you like it? Yeah. And at some of the events, we've had one or two of the vendors, but nobody has ever put together a package like CalRVIC did with a whole day dedicated to yeah. the software event. Uh, that was an amazing day. We got to learn about all the different software, well, a number of the different softwares that are out there. And each one of the software vendors got to, got to do a presentation. And then we also got a chance to sit down with each of them and get our hands dirty and, and really touch it, feel it, play with it. And uh, we switched softwares a few years ago. And that was one of the things that really was important for us was to be able to really dive deep into it and sit down, use it, and, and weigh the pros and the cons between all the different softwares. You know, it's, it, 
from a vent so i'd be like a vendor at these events right because i'm not a park owner i'm providing a service so as in it and speaking to the other vendors we found that that type of structure is unique because usually if you go to a california or an association event doesn't the california association but arvc whatever whatever the big event is you have a booth table set up and the park owners walk by your booth area and you may catch your attention they may you know they may be busy they may go into the restroom or you know whatever whereas the california rv park days it removes the table and you have a conversation. So now all of a sudden, do you find as a park operator that that becomes a more useful interaction with vendors? Because I, I find as a vendor, it creates a more meaningful engagement with a park operator. So instead of being a salesperson behind a desk, I'm somebody who's a business owner sitting beside you saying, here's what we can do. Does that make sense? Yes or no? You know, one of the things, the vendors are always trying to sell their product. Right. Because they're, they're, yeah. That, that's what they're in the business of doing. But us as consumers of those products, we really want to know why it is and what, what is unique or special or why we need their product. Yeah. And these events really, they, they turn the vendors from salespeople into experts. And usually at these events, we'll have the vendors come in and either do a seminar, some of them we've actually done sit-down roundtables with. Depending on the industry, we'll, we'll tailor it. But it really lets the park owners and the park operators see why we need these and change that reaction from a sales pitch into it turns the vendors into experts because the vendors have been doing this what they are experts whatever is unique about their product they've been doing it for a long time they know exactly what it is and what problems it solves so it really helps us as operators to to understand their products better than a typical booth setting does yeah and we have coverage from that so they can go you can go watch the videos and kind of see what those events are like so um that that talks about the associations a little bit so i guess um you know the other question that this this would be a question that other park operators who have only heard of california seen in the news or you know heard it's expensive so they're looking at you saying you own a business providing accommodations in california What's that like? What is it like running a business in the state of California? Running a business is difficult. When you add in all of the California regulations, uh, it definitely makes it a little bit more challenging. But, you know, California has a huge diversity. And here, here in Bakersfield, sometimes we say we're two hours from everything. There's very few places that you could be skiing in the mountains two hours from a location or two hours the other direction. You're sitting on the beach and it's sunny and warm. Uh, if, if you want a large uh, area, we're two hours from Los Angeles. We're, you know, so there's so much that you can do just in this area. And like we spoke earlier, even right here in Bakersfield, we've got a large country music history. We've got a rock and roll history. We've got a Basque history. We've got sports that are super popular here in Bakersfield. So there, there's so much diversity and so much history and culture here that it's it's amazing what California has to offer. So basically, what you're saying is the vibrant, the economic conditions here make up for the challenges of running a business. Yes, and, and there, there's, there's always something going on. The weather's typically pretty nice. We, we don't get the really bad weather that some areas get. And you know, there's, there's just so much available in California. Yeah, yeah. you're a year-round park. You're open, you're open Seven days a week, 365 days a year. So from a park operator standpoint, you know, maybe we're, so there's a few park operators who run a seasonal park. That's, you know, you run a seasonal park, you shut down, you can do some things. I guess I'll finish off with this. So running your experience after 10 years of running this park, seven days a week, 365 days a year, number one, would you advise anybody to do it? And number two, if they're jumping into doing it, what would you suggest they consider before jumping in? It's a lot of work. Uh, it, it's a huge, we enjoy it. It's a great opportunity, uh, but it is a lot of work. And being a year-round park, it is 365 days a year uh, that you're constantly having to uh, have issues and deal with different situations and, and keep it up. And sometimes the maintenance can be challenging because we are a year-round park. An example of that, a couple of years ago, we recoded our streets. Okay. And if you were a seasonal park, after the last RV left, you could 
close the gates, bring the construction crew in, and take care of it very quickly. Being that we were open with people coming and going throughout the time, oh, wow, yeah. we had to do sections of the park and, and really plan how we accomplished, uh, again, looking at our angle, we have to recoat the streets, how are we going to accomplish that and do it in a way that is as least disruptive to the guests that we have. Very interesting. So here's the question. If you knew what you knew now, 10 years ago, would you still be doing what you're doing right now? We'd still be doing it. Okay. We, we enjoy it, even with its challenges, even with the difficulties. Uh, again, the time that we spend with family, the relationships that we've built with our guests, uh, being, being able to see people come and smiles on their faces, it, it makes up for all of those difficult times. That's awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Thank you. So if you want to see more of these videos, we've done a bunch of these interviews. Go to campgroundviews.com and go to our YouTube channel. Subscribe and look for more. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm Mark Kep with campgroundviews.com. Thank you and goodbye.